Why would a young person commit a crime for an older influence in their lives? He groomed the hell out of him. But until we address the fact that the person was vulnerable, it'll just happen time and time again. Can love make you a murderer? Welcome to True Crime Unraveled, the show in which criminologists Onodora Townsend and me, Yinka Bikini, dive right into the heart of some of the biggest true crime stories. And we'll be having a look at some of the amazing documentaries and dramas that have brought these cases to life. In this episode, we're looking at the case of the Washington Sniper, who in 2002 terrorized Greater Washington DC with a string of random shootings. And we'll be taking a look at the documentary series, I Sniper the Washington Killers, which explores the motives behind the three week murder spree and uncovers the epic manhunt to track the killers down. The thing that this series did was put me in a really uncomfortable position as a viewer, sympathizing with somebody who has done something that you would describe as evil. Yeah, and it sort of feels like a bit of a cop-out to use terms like evil. It does, you know I mean? it does. Rather than addressing or acknowledging that there are underlying things that have gone on, especially with the, the age gap between Mohammed and Malvo, it does really feel like there was one main instigator here and it wasn't Malvo. Across three weeks in October of 2002, the Greater Washington DC area was terrorised essentially by a series of what seemed like totally random sniper attacks. Ten people were killed in total and three others were left in critical condition. The victims were just simply going about their day-to-day -day lives. And prior to this killing spree, the two offenders travelled across the states and again chose people at random and shot them using a sniper rifle. Talk to me about the criminals. Who were they? John Allen Mohammed, who was 41 years old at the time, and Lee Boyd Malvo, who was age 17. Malvo was born in Jamaica. Malvo's mother was described as being abusive, whereas Malvo's father was kind of the main caregiver. He was the one really looking out for him. John Mohammed was a former soldier, was in Antigua, with his own children from his second marriage and he was hiding there, hiding from his ex-wife. Malvo and Mohammed met in completely innocent circumstances. This clip describes the chance encounter of meeting John Mohammed, whose one act of fatherly kindness changed Malvo's life forever. So I just watched. Watched the relationship with his son. And his son said he was hungry and he walked across the street to the bakery, bought like five snapples, five cinnamon rolls, and just came and just sat one beside each of us without saying a word. That right there, that one action, we didn't have fathers like this. I had an ideal of a father, and I found that. He gave me hope. Can trauma in your own life really make you a killer? Time and time again, we do see a vast majority of people committing these serious violent crimes having some form of trauma. There does seem to be some kind of connection. So what happened when they both got back to the United States? When Mohammed went back, there then followed a, a custody case for his own children. And his children were taken off him. Okay and the two very quickly formed this bond. In this clip, we learn how Mohammed's wife served divorce papers and gained legal custody of his children in one day. Can you please tell me what's going on? There is a parenting plan that was entered by the court, which allows her to have the physical possession of the children. So you, are you telling me I won't be able to keep my children? No, I'm saying that you've got uh, no visitation at present. So I, I can't, I can't see my children. Uh, your visitation is suspended. Mildred and I, we were just tearful. The attorney was happening. We're walking outside. I turn and it's John. He's walking towards me. I take off down the hallway, shoes go everywhere. And John passes right by me, walking swiftly. John put his hand on the courtroom door, looked at me and said, gotcha. 
So you have childless father and fatherless child? Exactly. Okay. So Mohammed began training Malvo for war. He put Malvo on like a military regime. Fitness, diet, gun training, all of this kind of thing. We do have a guest with us today, Dr. Shante Francis, and she is a senior lecturer in youth justice and criminology. So thank you for joining us, Shanti. How are you doing? How are you feeling? You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful to meet you. Is it possible to be an offender, but also a victim at the yeah, same time? Because that's what yeah. I struggle with that in, in, in this case. Well, if you think about it, on one hand, you have the victim, who's, you know, this young person who's gone through various amounts of turmoil within his life but then you also have the offender because he's the person that shot the trigger right they're one in the same this person's still a young person he's still a child who has been manipulated and probably been manipulated since he was very young in order to kind of keep gaining that love in very loose terms mm -hmm. and gaining that kind of praise from that person that he really kind of missed within his childhood he's going to commit these acts wouldn't they know right from wrong? Particularly at the age of 17, you know, you're nearly an adult, you should know right from wrong. But we're talking about somebody who has multiple risk factors and these risk factors will be broken down between community, family, peers, school and the wider society. That is a recipe for disaster. Malvo would almost just do anything to continue this yeah. love that he was because getting. Because he wants that bond. Mohammed would have known that. So he could essentially, he just kept pushing the boundaries. First, I'll train you. Okay, now watch those violent movies. Now let's do target practice. Okay, now let's do that initiation shot. And it's just one thing after another. Okay, I'll do that, I'll make you happy. It's that consistent power dynamic and that's played through all the way through to the end till they got caught. Well, Dr. Francis, thank you so much. No, you're welcome, thank you for having me. These shootings were essentially a form of overkill. It's almost like he was trying to sneak in like, random person, random person, random person, ex-wife, ex random person, so that people wouldn't necessarily connect it to him. And we don't know that that's what the plan was, but there's a lot of theory and a lot of debate that it certainly points that way. The two perpetrators, Malvo and Mohammed, had bought a second-hand blue Chevy. They'd have Malvo lie in the boot to shoot his victims. And the police finally got their break because Malvo happened to leave the rifle's instruction manual at the scene of the crime, and it had 36 prints left all over it. They were then looking for any associates of Malvo, and they came across Mohammed's name. They had the record of him buying the blue Chevy that was used as the murder vehicle, essentially, and they had its license plate. And so this is when all the pieces start to come together for the investigation. A truck driver reported seeing the blue Chevy at a truck stop in the middle of the night and the police swarmed in. Both of the perpetrators surrendered without any sort of incident. There's the trial, the case, and in 2009, Mohammed was killed by lethal injection. He got the death penalty. Malvo is still serving six life sentences. To this day, he's still in prison. Without ever really having a life, if, if, if we're honest. Yeah, he was a kid when he went in and that's it now. That will be the only life he knows. Why do couples go on to kill? Why is that such a well-known phenomenon? And how does this relationship fit in it? The one that stands out related to this case is Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. That's where you have a dominant male mm -hmm. and accomplice, generally female, but submissive is the point. And obviously this case is, is two men, but it still has that sort of dominant versus submissive view. That power imbalance and the, the motivations and intentions of the more dominant force are definitely going to have an impact on the crime that then plays out. That means that the answer to our question, can love make you a murderer, is yes. Yeah. The wrong type of love, the wrong circumstances. And I think when that love does become this pathological obsession, it almost takes away the potential for any goodness that love can bring. If you want to watch the full series, I Sniper the Washington Killers, you can find it on all four, along with a whole range of other amazing true crime programs.